So, amen, I hope you got everybody greeted. If not, we'll have a few minutes here at the end of service where you can. Uh, especially wanted to, to note again, if you weren't here for our uh, opener at the first of service, uh, we always take time several times a year, but particularly this time of year to honor uh, our veterans and those who have served. Uh, Tuesday is, uh, I think it's Tuesday, isn't it? Veterans Day. And uh, so if you have served or are currently serving uh, in any branch of the military, uh, we appreciate your service. We honor that uh, so deeply, respect those who are willing to make that sacrifice. And uh, if so, would you stand? We just want to honor you and bless you this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you from all of us, but particularly from me and my family. Uh, I appreciate it greatly. Uh, in connection with uh, Veterans Day, we, last week we mentioned that no, the month of November we're setting aside to really focus on uh, orphan care and uh, it's orphan month uh, nationally to where we focus on uh, not only uh, foster care and adoption, but caring for as James said, widows and orphans uh, in their distress, pure and undefiled religion. And so uh, the connection between uh, Veterans Day and uh, Orphans Month is not lost on me. And many of those are not uh, orphaned literally because their uh, parent who serves in the military or who has served uh, paid the ultimate price. Uh, but that same dynamic, the sacrifice of long periods of time spent away at strategic times uh, in children's lives and, and the dynamics in families. And so I, I trust that as we go through the message today, one of the key points that we w focus on here from Daniel's life is his consistency and persistence in prayer. And that's something that we all need to grow in. Uh, it's something that we all need to prioritize. And uh, the, the way in which Daniel responded to me is a phenomenal example to us. And asking God and the, the Spirit of the Lord to direct our prayers and bring awareness of things we might not know. Uh, and then when he does reveal that to us, as he did with Daniel through his word, then we ask him, how do I respond and one of the best responses that we can have is exactly what Daniel did, is to turn to the Lord. And when it's good news, we turn to the Lord with rejoicing. When it's bad news, we turn to the Lord in fasting and prayer. And, and we prepare our hearts to respond appropriately uh, in the spirit of that, take the word of God and make application to our life, and then let the Holy Spirit do a deep work in us because it's not just natural, it's spiritual. Can you say amen? amen? And the battle we fight may be literal and natural, um, but there's uh, spiritual dynamics behind it. And we'll talk about that a little more next week uh, as we kind of wind down our, our series here in conclusion, or it'll be in two weeks, I guess. So this morning, as we look at that, I want you to turn in your Bibles with me, if you would, to uh, Daniel chapter 9. And Darren covered the first uh, part of Daniel chapter 9 last week, and so I'll just kind of pick up where he left off, and uh, Daniel has this vision. It's basically the last six chapters of Daniel are four visions that um, God emphasizes different aspects to Daniel and then summarizes what he's seeing because the, the encounter with God and that experience is so overwhelming, he didn't know how to respond. And physically, uh, we'll see here and in chapter 10 and later on that he can't respond. He faints. And then after uh, God touches him and raises him back on his feet and speaks strength to him and peace to him, he said, I'm still standing there with my legs shaking and I was trembling. And I said, Lord, I understand. I heard what you said, but I didn't understand what you meant. And so sometimes we get in that where we can have an emotional response, but we miss what God wants to say to us. Can you say amen? amen. Come on, help your pastor out this morning. Amen. 
All right? And so some of y'all looking like you got this all figured out. I know what the 77s represent. I know the exact day Jesus is going to return. And you know that ain't true. Jesus didn't even know. And so sometimes when we get into these realms of prophecy, we have a tendency to think, oh man, that's, that's forever. You know, I don't even know if I'll live long enough to see it. Or to think when we look at history and what God's walked people through, to think that that doesn't apply to us. And so those who don't understand history, as the saying goes, are doomed to repeat it. And when we look back, we see that many times people have missed it. Even the church has missed tremendous opportunities to impact people groups because we haven't understood the times in which we are living or we haven't responded well to what the Spirit of God was leading us to do. And so God wants to bring us to this place, particularly as the end draws closer and closer. And, and basically what the Lord did was give Daniel supernatural insight, uh, and, and he saw in the Spirit world events that would take place um, shortly after the time of that encounter, and then some that would take place even in our day, and some that are yet to take place. But God summarized all of that in Daniel's life. The explanation that came through the angel Gabriel to him was basically God condensed 490 years of biblical prophecy into and condensed it all. Now, that's not 490 years consecutively of time, but it was 490 years that were separated by three time periods, uh, seven uh, years and then uh, 62 times seven, uh, where he says there, there'll be a period of 77s. And so he basically summarizes the first seven, then 69 or 62 more sevens, which equals 69. And then there's one seven at the end which he was focused on, which, which much of that is there that is yet to be fulfilled. And so there have been generations where there have been similar signs that Daniel saw that have been fulfilled, but there's never been any generation in history that has had all of those signs fulfilled all in the same generation except ours except this generation. And so 69 of the 77s that we'll talk about here in a minute, don't let that confuse you, I'm gonna make it real simple. 69 of the 77s or periods of seven years have already been fulfilled prophetically. And that from that, when the last one begins, here is what Daniel sees, the key event will be the rebuilding of the temple of Jerusalem that was destroyed, which will be the sign of the, the end of the 69th seven will end with the destruction of that temple. And then a decree will be issued for it to be rebuilt, which already has been, but it hadn't been rebuilt yet. And when it's rebuilt, uh, that there will be a, a period of three and a half years where a man of lawlessness, we already determined that was not Darren a couple weeks ago, so don't worry about that. Um, that, that the Antichrist or this world ruler that has incredible influence and power, but not natural power, supernatural power will rise and he won't have a huge army, but he'll be incredibly effective. And then he and his people will destroy the temple that's been rebuilt. But before they do, they will set up in that temple. He will set up an image or an idol of himself and the people will be forced to worship him instead of Christ. And he will set up that image in the most holy place in the temple when it's rebuilt. He will eliminate sacrifice. He will eliminate worship of the Lord and will receive all of that unto himself. And then a, a tremendous persecution, tribulation will break out against the people of God. And then Jesus will return and bring an end to the end. And he will say, the end. But for us who serve Christ, it's a new beginning, all right? And so to think that Daniel saw those things all the way back in the Old Testament, and then we went through the, 
the time of the prophets, major prophets and the minor prophets, and then the end of Scripture of the Old Testament in Malachi, and then there's 400 years historically of silence where history continued on, but, but the Old Testament ends with Malachi and this prophetic uh, word of before Christ comes that he will send the spirit of Elijah and that he will turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children back to the fathers unless he come and strike the earth with a curse. And that was prophetic of John the Baptist coming and then Christ coming. And so then it picks up in the New Testament and goes all the way through to the end. And so Daniel saw all those things in the spirit. He didn't understand them. He saw these incredible visions. And so he asked, he, he, it prompted him to return or respond to God with prayer and fasting, with grieving when he realized wait a minute, people's hearts aren't right. This, this, we're your people. And God, your kingdom rules over any other earthly kingdom. But the people don't get it. They're becoming like the world and they're responding like people in the world. And, and so he said, Lord, I, 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 somebody has to repent. And so he said, let it be me. And so he turned to God with prayer and fasting and confession and repentance and he called out not only his own sin, but the sins of his people. Now, he wasn't naming names and calling people out. He was taking responsibility for their actions. He was taking on the burden of their sins. That's true intercession. That, that he's, he's basically, here's God, here's, here's the people because of their sin. There's this great gap that's separating them, and Daniel stepped into the gap. It, interceding literally means that, that, that he reaches out to take a, a hold of God and, and the words of God and the hand of God, and he also reaches out in prayer to connect with people, to bring them closer together, and in prayer, God begins to move supernaturally and to reconnect those hearts, because it's what God wants to do. If we don't do that, many times what we do is step back, and it's very easy to take on a spirit of judgment. I just want you to know that nowhere in, the, in Jesus' description of the end times does he say you are to be the judge. He isn't even the judge. He's the one who stands in our defense when we've accepted him. The Father is the only one who judges the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. That there will be a time when all of us stand before a throne of judgment, but because of what Christ has done, we can also come boldly before a throne of grace. I like that one. And so many times what we miss when we get caught up in the beasts and the dragons and the wars and the famine and the, uh, all of this horrible stuff that's going to take place and that the, the people of God will be hated because of Christ and will be tortured and put to death. And we're thinking, man, Lord, just take me out. And God said, no, that's why you're there. That, that we need to respond not like the disciples when they came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you just tell us what time you're coming back, we'll be ready. And really, the deception of that is what? We all think we can get ready sooner than what we do. Some of you were late for church this morning. We, we, we had monitors. We have it on video. We had people taking names. Now, you fully intended to be here on time because you didn't want to miss it because you know, man, Pastor's back, things are gonna be great, I'm ready for service, I can't wait to get there. I know, I really know that's what you're feeling. I know that many of you didn't stay up late last night watching football games, because that's just of the world. All right, you with me here? You say, well wait, how does this fit into where, because sometimes we think if we just knew the time, then, then we'd, we'd have plenty of time to get ready. Okay, and sometimes we think getting ready is that last little hair in place. Rather than preparing our hearts, I get to come worship God. I get to come meet with the people of God and, 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 and worship and that connection, fellowship time. Man, I need that. 
And sometimes we do it with a sense of dread because that, that our faces might be scrubbed and we might be looking decent and at least have the best of what we have to come before God, but our hearts aren't clean. And we struggled and there's issues and if people really knew what was going on in me, maybe they wouldn't want me there. And so the accuser comes and he begins to whisper, oh, you got plenty of time. You got plenty of time. You can drive a little faster. You got plenty of time. And so the disciples came with that same mentality. Jesus, when will you return? And he said, it's not about the when, but here's what you need to understand to, to stay ready. And he said, you don't need to be deceived because many will be deceived. Don't be deceived by those who come and say they're the Christ. And he said, don't be alarmed. Don't be deceived, don't be alarmed. And then he just says, you need to stay steady. You need to determine in your heart that you're gonna stand firm to the end because those who stand firm to the end will be saved. Well, Peter in uh, 1 Peter, uh, several places, actually 1 and 2 Peter, addresses the, the end times, the end of things. I put his uh, a short passage here from 2 Peter in your notes. Let me just read this. 2 Peter, or 1 Peter chapter 4 says this. We are near the end of time, the end of things now. This is the Phillips translation. And you should therefore be calm, self-controlled, men of prayer. Above everything else, be sure that you have real deep love for each other, remembering how love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to each other without secretly wishing you hadn't got to be. Uh, the, another translation says, offer hospitality without grumbling. I like how he says, be, be hospitable to one another without secretly wishing you didn't have to be. Somebody needs a meal, somebody needs a place to stay, offer hospitality. And then the last thing uh, he says here is serve one another with the particular gifts or spiritual gifts that God has given each of you as faithful dispensers of the magnificently varied grace of God. So he says, Use your spiritual gifts to manifest God's grace in its various forms. Offer hospitality. In other words, don't disconnect relationally, but look for opportunities to connect relationally. That's very practical stuff. We live in the most connected age uh, electronically that's ever been, but we live the most disconnected lives relationally that we've ever had. We don't have to depend on one another anymore and actually have face-to-face -face relationships. We can just Google it. But you can't have a relationship with Google. And so we have virtual relationships. And people are virtually deceived because I just, I like to see my wife's image on the phone, but there's nothing, I, I've, I've tried kissing the screen. It's just not the same. It's, it's that, that whole and Jesus did the same thing. He bridged the gap. He didn't just speak it. He didn't just say it. It wasn't just this holy mystery that he came to put skin on to totally identify with us, to be a sacrifice so we could totally connect with the Father, even when we felt disconnected, that we're not sons and daughters. We're, we're on the run. We're prodigals. And God's word reaches us all the way in the pig pen and brings us back to the palace. And the father says, been waiting for you. We got some work to do. I love you. And he said, but first we're gonna celebrate the fact that you're home. So welcome home. All right, and so you say, well, pastor, how does that all fit together? I'm glad you asked. Because all the way back in Daniel, when he had these overwhelming visions, Daniel responded in his heart. And he responded in prayer. He responded because he was reading the words of the prophet, the, the scriptures at the time, if you will, Jeremiah. And when he understood from the scriptures or responded to the word of God and then he responded in prayer is where it, it, the, the 
uh, vision was made clear to him, and the, the angel Gabriel came to give him insight spiritually into what he was seeing, even in the natural, and how it was affecting him. And he told him, from the moment you began to pray, a word went out. And I've come in response to that word. In other words, the moment you began to pray, God answered your prayer. And I've come to tell you what the answer to your prayer is. He was praying for his nation. He was praying for Jerusalem. He was praying for not only the holy city, but the holy hill, the place of God's temple, his presence to return to that. And as he was praying, God said, I've already answered that. And so Gabriel, go tell him that as soon as you began to pray, a word went out. And as soon as that word came out, then I'm responding to it. I just want you to get this morning that when we determine in our hearts to respond to God in prayer, it moves heaven. Now, it doesn't change what is set in the will of God. Prayer doesn't change God's will. Prayer doesn't change God's heart. Prayer changes our heart to get in line with God's will. Prayer brings us understanding of the time in which we live and the times that God is moving. Prayer brings us in line with the one who's willing to take responsibility not only for their sin, but also the sins of others, and what a difference we can make in the world in which we live simply because we pray. The other thing is that Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, who stood in the presence of God, told Daniel, you're somebody. You are highly esteemed. Now, now, the question that I want to ask you this morning is, if Daniel was esteemed in heaven because of his prayer life, is your name known there? Let me ask it a better way. Is your name revered in hell because of your heart for Christ and your willingness to pray and intercede for others? Let me ask it another way. It's not, do you know Jesus? Does he know you? Does he hear your voice? Does he hear you saying, Lord, we bear your name? Lord, we live in a time where you're not honored. There's reproach. There's these issues. God, it moves me deeply. It grieves me. It burdens me. It bothers me. Well, what do you do when you're bothered? What do you do when you're angry or hurt or upset? What do you do when it's like, oh, man, that's terrible. Where do you take your terribles? If you bring them to the Lord, what he replaces is, man, life stinks. This is terrible. I hate this place. Lord, get me out of here. And and so we start hoping we can sing, I'll fly away, oh, glory, enough times that it'll work, and we'll all go. But we don't understand that God's patience doesn't mean he's slow in keeping his promises, that God's patience simply means there's an opportunity for more people to come to know him. There's an opportunity for more people to get saved. That today, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father in heaven, waiting anxiously, but he doesn't know when he's going to return. So he's asking the Father, I can just picture it in my mind, of Jesus going, today, can I go today? Can I go today? Look, my horse is saddled up. Everything's ready to go. Trumpet blasts are ready. Angels are here and they're all standing at attention waiting for the word of the Lord. But Jesus isn't going to go until the father says, and he's, no, there's, there's one more. Look, he's hearing it. He's getting it. Look, there's one more people group. They just got the New Testament translated in their language. There's one more. Look, there's one more standing up as a missionary volunteering to go. There's one more. There's one more high school kid at Oak Grove that's going to have guts enough to stand out and say to somebody who's just a stoner, look, can, can I ask you a question? Just like Darren did this morning. Is there something missing in your life? An opportunity to connect. And the father's holding back Jesus until all have had an opportunity to hear. 
Daniel saw that. He saw Alexander the Great. He saw the Roman civilization rise and fall. In a glimpse, in a moment, and God condensed it all down and he said, here's what this means. 490 years of prophetic history broken into these three sections and you've been given understanding because you responded right. You responded in prayer. You responded to the word of God. You responded to the spirit. And you responded with love and you responded with a heart of mercy. As Daniel said in chapter nine when he finished that whole section in prayer that Darren led us through last week, he said, God, I don't pray to you because of my righteousness. I make this request because of your great mercy. Lord, hear me. Lord, respond. You need to act because the city and this people bear your name. He wasn't telling God what to do. He was totally opening his heart. He was filled and flooded, not only with this incredible vision by the spirit of the Lord, but with the love of God. He was baptized in the spirit and baptized in love. And what he felt was God's mercy, not God's judgment. And listen, when you are people of the spirit and we begin to walk in the spirit, that's the same thing we feel and experience. Does your heart break this morning with the things that break the heart of God? Do, do you go to the scriptures with this anticipation of what God's going to speak and reveal to you? Or is it another, oh man, I don't get that. That's just, that's crazy. You know, there's disease and all this stuff, man, that's just weird. That's freaky. What was that guy smoking when he wrote that? Instead of letting God speak about things that are mysteries that you don't know, the scripture says there are some things that are too wonderful for you. The scripture says the things that are revealed belong to you, belong to God's people, but the things that are hidden belong to God and they're for his glory. And so God takes some of the hidden things, some of the mystery, and he reveals it to us by the Spirit because he entrusts it to us. But the real key is how do we respond? If you turn there on the back side, if you've got your note page, let me just give you these fill-ins because I just covered them briefly, but I want to make sure you get them and then go back through it and then we'll see here specifically some instances where this worked not only in Daniel's example, but some other New Testament writers that spoke about the end times. Second Peter uh, chapter 311 says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, talking about the end times, the end of that final seven, okay, when, when th that, uh, those events converge and that's that seven year period there with the great tribulation and the end of things. And uh, he said, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? I love that question. Not, not what should you do, what kind of people should you be? And so I'm assuming that you like that question too. It's a good question. It has no quick answer. It, it causes us to not just think, but process. What kind of people ought you to be. There's five things that we see from Daniel's life that we see that Jesus spoke about that Peter referenced and even Jude, that little letter, a little half-page email, if you will, tucked in right before Revelation. And he has some very profound things to say, but all of those Basic things come together. Okay, I want you to see that all the way back, years before, generations before, these things begin to come to pass, when Daniel saw them, this was his response, these five things. And that when Jesus picked up on that in Matthew 24 and specifically referenced the fact that the prophet Daniel saw these things and spoke of these things, 
Not only did he affirm the, the validity of Daniel's prophecy, but Jesus then took it back to the practical. It's not about you figuring out the time. It's about what kind of people you ought to be. It's how should you respond when, when you're in the midst of that, when you see those things. He said, don't be deceived. Don't be alarmed. Stay steady. Stand firm. Because he who stands firm to the end. And Jesus said, here's, here's going to be the sign right before the end of it all, that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Okay? That's a process, not a moment in time. And we're living in the generation where not only is that possible, that is happening. That, that in our generation, all of the unreached people groups of the world have not only been identified, but have been targeted in prayer and targeted with the scriptures or at least a portion of it and targeted by various groups, the church cooperating together, go figure, around the world to plant churches in those nations, in their languages, to raise up pastors and leaders among those people. That all happens is now and is all converging in our generation. That's why in our sanctuary, it's not just decorations. Those flags hanging above your heads are for a reason. This is the sign. This is our job before the end comes. And there are days when I think, how long, how long, O oh Lord? Even so, come Lord Jesus. Uh, Jennifer said that that was what God was speaking to her this morning. This is an even so moment. How about y'all? Even so, even all this junk I'm walking through, even so. Well, here's the even so. Daniel was in exile, living in a foreign country, but he spent over 80 years of his life being faithful to God in an ungodly culture. Taking on the abuse and the scorn and the shame of what people would heap on his God and those who worship false gods sometimes seem to get promoted and encouraged over him, but he stayed steady in the midst of it. These were attributes out of Daniel's life that Jesus referenced and that Peter references and Jude brings us into line with. And I think for us this morning, the great question is, uh, are we living, is not, are we living in the last days? Yes, we are. We've been living in the last days since God poured out his spirit in the book of Acts. We've been living in the church age and we see that, but the book of Revelation takes two chapters to cover the church age and then goes through the rest of those end time events and that's where some of us gets lost with, okay, what's it gonna be? Have seals and bowls and trumpets and dragons and let's just bring it down to this. What kind of people ought you to be? Okay, Jesus said you should watch, that you should pray, and that you should be alert. Jesus said that. That you should watch and pray and be alert and looking for the signs not for the time. Look for the signs. I spent a little time in Dallas last week, and not only was I looking for signs, I was looking for the time. And, and with all the construction in Dallas, even GPS was ridiculous. Here's how bad it was. You know my thing with the GPS lady? It's a demon. And it's just, I'm telling you, it really is, and it's verified. So, so because of all the construction in, in Dallas, my GPS was virtually useless. So having resources and backup like I do, I pulled out my phone and I Googled it. And I put Google Maps on my cell phone, ran it through my car, and had my regular, my old timey GPS over here, which was obsolete. And now I have two ladies talking to me, recalculating, telling me, they don't know where I am either. <laughs> now, I don't know about your GPS, but after the second or third time, they say recalculating, recalculating. Or they say, when possible, make a U-turn. <laughs> or um, at the next exit, turn and make, make a legal U-turn. I'm thinking, eh, I ain't been legal since I crossed the border. <laughs> and it's not about legal or safe. This is crazy. And, and so as we were... Going through, now, now I have two of them, and thinking, oh, great. And so I realized that a cord of three strands is not easily broken, and I was quickly getting into bondage. 
So I muted them both. It was joyous. You know, but when they said, here's the sign, and, 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 but a lot of, with the construction, they've even moved exits like a mile down from where it was. So I'm coming up to the exit. And so it wasn't about when they said, you know, in 6.4 miles, you need to turn. Because they changed where you need to turn. So what I had to look for was not just the, the, the sign as I was getting close to the street because I wasn't familiar with any of them. I had to look for the sign above the interstate and where the exit was, and it was a mile before where I was supposed to turn. But as long as I looked for the signs and not just depended on the words of the demon ladies <laughs> speaking to me through the GPS, in other words, it's so much easier for us to trust our technology than it is for us to trust the sign. Turn here. Beach Street. You know, whatever. And, and so once you're there and you can navigate, you can see a sign a little farther in the distance and then you can bring down the details of, okay, if I can just get in the general vicinity, th then I can find the specific location. And basically that's what Jesus did. He said, follow the signs and you're gonna get close. And then there's, within those signs is the beginning. He said, th this sign is gonna be the beginning of birth pains. Well, I've had five children. Well, Kim had the children. I've been part of the process in several pregnancies. And so as we were walking through that, I realized the beginning of birth pains is not the birth of the child. That's the beginning of the tribulation. <laughs> and all the ladies said, amen. But it's with joy that's set before us that we endure. And so going through the process... See, it's like, okay, hey, I got the bag packed. Here we go. You know, we, we speed to the hospital, realizing that, you know, we've done this three times before and it's been false labor. Well, how do you know the difference between false labor and true? Ask your wife. Okay, and so it's this, but it, and so I'm sure the disciples kind of felt that way when Jesus used a birth illustration with a group of guys. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, man, wait a minute. He said, when you see these signs, it's the beginning of birth pains. It's not the beginning of delivery. It's the beginning of the process. And that process can take however long. He said, in the middle of it, it's going to be difficult. But in the end, it all comes out all right to those who love God. All right, and so Daniel went through the process and they, all of the New Testament writers speak of these same things. Here are the five things. What kind of people ought we to be? Number one, we need to be people of the word. We need to be people of the word. Daniel said, when I understood from the scriptures that the, the destruction of uh, Jerusalem, that, that per time period would be 70 years, I turned to the Lord with prayer and fasting, sackcloth and ashes, I turned in genuine repentance. I turned in confession. I turned to the Lord because I understand the word. I, I just can't say it strongly enough here from your pastor's heart. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Get a Bible translation that you can understand and read it. And the parts you don't understand let the other parts give understanding. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Don't be so quick to go to other people's opinions. It's not about charts and graphs and all that. It's about saying, Holy Spirit, help me understand this. Show me, run some cross references, get, get some connections, and God begins to speak to you, and then it's gonna open your heart more and more. What kind of people ought we to be? We need to be people of the word. Say people of the word. Second thing Daniel was, he was a man of prayer. And we need to be people of prayer. I, I love the fact that when uh, the scripture says of Daniel, uh, when, he, uh, when I understood the, the scriptures, I turned to the Lord in prayer and fasting. And he said, um, in verse 20, talking about that time of Daniel chapter nine, he said, while I was speaking and praying, they're not the same thing. That you can pray without speaking and you can speak without praying. 
Are you with me here? While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request, prayer is not just asking. And so he's praying his repentance, he's praying his sin, he's praying his grief, he's praying his people's disobedience, he's praying history, he's praying his heart, he's praying his fears, he's praying his doubt, he's praying honest prayers out of the abundance of his heart, sometimes with words, sometimes not. Sometimes I was just talking to God. Sometimes I was just speaking to myself. What does this mean? I wonder what that was. I, I remember that time, and he may have written it down or just spoken it in his heart. The disobedience of a people that would bring and separate us from God's love and protection. This is why we are where we are. And then he didn't say, God, this is all your fault, and I'm mad at you. And he said, I'm going to make that a request because I know he's a God of mercy. He understood that and he stood on it so strongly that, that in the end, he said, Lord, I'm not making these requests because I'm righteous. He'd already confessed the sin and, and, and repented of it. He said, it's not about my righteousness. It's about your mercy. Come on, somebody. All right, and so talking about us being people of prayer, it isn't just this little blessing your meal. That's great. That's, that's a start. I remember connecting years ago when I was a youth pastor. God bless all the youth pastors. And uh, doing my time, and, and uh, we had a girl who, who connected with our youth group that was, we, and we had a, a prayer time, and it was really incredible and so she'd been around, but she was a brand new believer. And so when we asked her, would you like to lead in prayer? Her, her eyes kind of got big and her face flushed. And, 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 and she was like, uh, sure. And I said, okay, just pray whatever's in your heart. And she said, um, now, now I lay me down to sleep. And pray that, and of course, it, all the other kids were like, is that a joke? I mean, they snickered a little bit, and, you know, then she kind of got embarrassed. And I'm thinking, wow, it's the only prayer she knew how to pray. And so I said, let's all say it together. And I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Amen. And all these teenagers looked at me like, what? And I said, you know, that's the essence of prayer right there. The simplicity, the heart of a child speaking to God. That we can trust him. We can give him our lives. We can sleep securely. Went through this whole thing. And so one of my leaders, who was much more mature in the Lord, was the one that's just kind of there, and you know, when, when kids get fidgety, you know it's either good or bad. With this guy, it's usually bad. So, so I kind of put him on the spot, and I said, and what prayer would you like to pray? And he was like, uh, I'm good. <laughs> Look, our hearts, when we turn to God, we think that we got to have it all together. And we got to say all this whatever, just use Daniel's prayer. It's perfect. What a great model. Jesus taught his disciples a model prayer. He didn't say repeat these words exactly. He just said, pray after this manner. When you pray, pray to a father who's in heaven. Pray your heart. Ask him to forgive you as you forgive others. Ask him to provide for you because he wants to provide. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil because that's what Jesus came to do and, and realize that his is the glory and the kingdom and the power forever and ever. Amen. He didn't say that's the only prayer you should pray. He said, here's a model. I would submit to you that in difficult times, turbulent times, and especially in the end times, Daniel's prayer is a great model as well. 
Lord, I confess my sin, the sin of my people. I repent for stuff I hadn't even done yet. Lord, I repent on behalf of somebody else. Why? Because it brings us all under God's mercy. It brings us all under God's grace. It's not pretense. It's learning. It's growing in grace. It's opening our hearts to God. So we need to be people of the word. We need to be people of prayer. Third thing is we need to be people of the spirit. People of the spirit. The spirit of God is what gave Daniel that ability to not only see into the future prophetically and have these visions and revelations, but it's the one who, who gave him insight and understanding and it's the, the power and ability that God blessed us with as a church to fulfill that great commission. And, and I think that we are living in a culture where as those things, particularly the gifts of the Spirit that are so unique to, to the empowerment of who we are and they manifest God's grace in various forms, are coming more and more under fire and are being mocked and uh, excluded by many. Uh, unfortunately, even from the pulpit, that God doesn't do that anymore, God doesn't use those gifts anymore, and if you do, that's not God, that if you speak in tongues, that's demons, all that kind of thing. Jesus said, in the end times, there will be people who will come who will be false teachers that will simply come to divide. And he also said that even among God's people, there will be this division that they will betray and hate one another. And so the Spirit of God is what brings that together in unity. And he said, I will testify to you of everything Jesus has spoken. He's the Spirit of truth. And when Jesus said, don't be deceived, the, the, the remedy for deception is truth. I think uh, Ethan's going to talk about that Wednesday night in our uh, youth night here. But y'all are, are young in the Spirit, so come join us as we continue to talk about truth versus lies. But particularly... Walking in the Spirit, what does that mean? To genuinely live a Spirit-filled life. And, and when we understand that, the Spirit of God brings us, in, brings us to realms of insight and understanding that we can't get anywhere else. He, he brings us back to the Word. He, he prompts and inspires our prayer. Romans 8 says, when you don't know how to pray as you ought. Anybody ever been overwhelmed like Daniel? Daniel? And you couldn't get over the shakes and the trembling and the whatever because you were just devastated or afraid. I don't know what to say. Help. That's a start. But the Holy Spirit then will begin to pray through you without words sometimes. Groanings that are too deep for you to even give vocabulary to. But he'll also bear witness with your spirit that you're a son or a daughter of God. He'll make intercession with you according to, through you according to the will of God. And so the spirit of the Lord not only enhances and clarifies and directs your prayer, empowers you to be able to do that, but Jude says that as you pray in the spirit, you build yourselves up in your most holy faith. And he's talking about one of the key aspects of living in the end times. That you need to be built up and you need to be strong. And you need to understand that this isn't just natural stuff you're experiencing. That, that it's the, the spirit of the Lord behind it and the spirit of the enemy against it. And that you're fighting this incredible battle that you don't understand, just like Daniel was. In Daniel chapter 10, not only does he hear from uh, uh, Gabriel, Michael joins him. The two archangels of God. And, and they both respond to the same thing. When you started to pray, God answered your prayer. And God sent us to answer that prayer. But Michael says, the prince of Persia resisted me 21 days. Didn't defeat me just resisted me. But now I've come in response to your prayer. It was answered as soon as you started praying, but you prayed it all the way through to the end. You didn't understand there was this spiritual battle going on in the heavenly realms. That's my job. I'm here to tell you what's going on up there. You don't think that was overwhelming? God hears your prayer. God highly esteems those who will take their hearts to him in prayer and in faith, believe, 
push past the mysteries and what they don't understand and what they don't get and, and what's not happening yet and the miracle they haven't seen and the breakthrough that's not theirs and they take the tears and turn them into liquid prayer. And they take their hearts that are broken and they put those pieces together on an altar and not say, oh God, fix my broken heart. They say, God, here's every piece of my heart. It's broken. I would love to present it to you whole. But God, it's been broken by life. But you're a God of mercy and you can fix it. Then you don't have to say, "Um, and I, I hope you hear my prayer. And um, I'm going to live really, really, really good because I don't want to be on the naughty list. It's the Spirit of God bringing you to a different level of maturity and letting you know that life can be tough, but through the Spirit, you can be tougher. And you don't get harder, you get softer, but stronger. And so then, the, the last two aspects of that that we need to incorporate into our life, then we can be people of love. People of love. Well, well, what's, all, what's that all about? Well, for God so loved the world that he began the end by sending his son to give us all a new beginning. Because he didn't want anybody to perish. And God's patience means salvation for more people. And the motivation of all that was what? God's wrath? No, God's love. God's love. Love covers a multitude of sin. In fact, when Jude references that and Peter both, they reference the fact that love covers Peter says, in the last days, it's going to be difficult. And so here's what we need to do. Above all, you got to love big. Above all else, you got to keep your love on. Above all else, you got to live passionately with a love for God and you got to learn to love people. You got to learn to love the lost. You gotta learn to love people who don't look like you. You gotta learn to love people who don't act like you. And you gotta learn to love people who don't love you back and won't. That's the love of Christ. Then the last thing is that it totally opens our life up because as we walk through those other four, we begin to understand how merciful that God's been to us. So we need to be people of mercy. Mercy. Why? Why? Because mercy triumphs over judgment. For too many years, the church has professionalized being the judge. Judging people by their exterior, judging people by their actions, judging people by their heart. Have have you noticed how easy it is for you to judge other people by their actions, but you want them to judge you by your intentions? Doesn't work that way, does it? Because you know, I mean, really, come on. Or or that's probably the number one phrase that I get pushed back when I'm talking to people about the things of the Lord. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. It's real easy for me to say, I'm not the judge. Hallelujah. Or you're, you know, tried. Life sentence. Off with his head. I said, you don't want me to judge you. And that's not my role. I'm just not that great. I'm just a guy that's received God's mercy. And I'm thankful that I don't have to bear the weight of judgment. I leave that to God as you will have to as well. And instead, what we see and receive is God's incredible mercy for us. So say, how does that work practically? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's finish this passage here in Daniel and we'll see all of these things that are there. Uh, Daniel goes through and talks about, uh, let me find it here. The first half of the uh, chapter is where he finishes his prayer. And in verse 20 then it says, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, 
uh, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man who I had seen earlier in the vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and he said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. And in three verses, he summarizes the whole thing, or four. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, notice it's capitalized, that's a title, that's Jesus, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and then a period of 62 sevens. Okay, seven sevens uh, uh, plus 62 sevens. Seven plus 62 equals... Seven, that's a question. Seven plus 62 equals 69. Okay, 62 times seven equals 434. Okay, so there's one, one period of seven years and uh, the, the temple will be destroyed and that the anointed one then will God's heart and God's plan for that will be established. Then there'll be this period of 62 sevens or 434 years. And so from the time that the decree was issued and that Jerusalem was rebuilt and the temple was rebuilt, that was a period of seven years. Then there's 62 sevens or 434 years, which is exactly to the day that Christ died on the cross. The anointed one will come, the ruler, and be established. So it's actual, that window of history. The first seven of the sevens, and then 62 sevens, or 434 years. 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament, the birth of Christ, 33 years uh, of his life on earth in a human body, and then his death, burial, and resurrection when the Holy One is cut off and has nothing. He's buried under the earth, and then he rises from the dead, pours out the Holy Spirit, and begins this next series, okay? So 62 plus seven, 69 of the 77s have already been fulfilled, and we're waiting on the final seven the 70th seven. And God is giving us this incredible opportunity to take this gospel into all the nations of the earth so that we can speed the end. And so here he goes on, Gabriel explaining to uh, Daniel. Uh, Seven sevens and 62 sevens, it will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Verse 26, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off. That's Christ dying on the cross and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come to destroy the city and the sanctuary. That happened in 70 AD. The, the temple was completely destroyed. City was completely destroyed. And, and now there's a, uh, uh, another building there on that site. And so there'll, there'll have to be this whole change in dynamic literally in Jerusalem. It says, um, until the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many, talking about the, this ruler who would rise, the Antichrist, for one seven. Here's the final one. And in the middle of the seven, or three and a half years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering and a wing of the temple On a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation, an image of himself there in the temple, in the holy place, 
until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So once again, Scripture, Peter's question, since the end of things is near and we understand how that will end, what kind of people ought we to be? I want you to listen to these words from Jude, the little book uh, letter, actually, and speaking of the same thing at the same time. He says, uh, let me find it here. In verse 17, but dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. And to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Here's the words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24. Speaking of the end times, the end of the end, he says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Notice he didn't say they'll stop loving. They'll just love coldly. How how do you do that? You love in judgment. You love because you have to. You love because they're pitiful. And and they don't deserve it, but you're going to do that anyway. And it becomes a stronghold. Francis Frangipane called it the stronghold of cold love. Jesus didn't love us coldly. Jesus loved us passionately. Jesus loves us warmly. Jesus loves our brokenness. Jesus loved us in our sin. Jesus stepped down into our mess and loved us out of it. Cold love will never get you there. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Rather than us trying to figure out the date or the time or the moment or the hour, we take Jesus at his word saying, you're never gonna get it. I don't even know it. Only the Father knows it. The real question that we should ask is, what kind of people ought we to be? And we ought to be people of the word that search it, look for the signs, look what Jesus said, look at those things that point to him and build our relationship with him. We ought to be people of prayer, really allowing the spirit of God to work with us as we cooperate with heaven and realize that God esteems the person of prayer, that heaven takes notice of them. And when you start feeling insignificant in a world full of people and you don't feel as important or as influential or whatever, when you get down on your knees, heaven pays attention to you. Think of it. And as a result of that, he fills us with his spirit so that we can not just read the word of God, we can understand and have insight, as Paul said, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation works in us so we can know God better. If we know him better, we know his heart better. We can be people of the spirit, we can be people of love, and we can be people We don't put ourselves in a position of judgment, but we live with a spirit of mercy because God has been so merciful to us. Is anybody else excited about that this morning? Can you just lift your hands where you are and thank God for his mercy towards you? Thank him for pouring his spirit out upon us all, but bringing us to that place this morning where instead of his judgment, instead of his wrath that we deserved, we receive his mercy. That the sacrifices that we make aren't really sacrifices at all, but they're things that we release to God so he can fill us with more of him. Thank him that his word is a light in the darkness, 
a lamp to your next step on the path. And if that path is wide, then we can see where to step and walk securely. If that path is narrow, it's even more treacherous. It's even more dangerous. But God gives us security and God gives us strength to walk it out. Thank him that you have access today to his spirit. Some of you just need to stir that up. Some of you just need to ask God, Lord, I don't even understand what that's all about, but speak to me. Show me that in your word. Fill me with your spirit, Lord, because I need to be built up. I need to be strengthened. I I need to be strong in my faith because I want to be the one who'll stand firm to the end. Establish yourself in love and determine that you're going to live the same mercy that God poured out on you. Lord, I thank you for it this morning. I thank you for the influence that you have given us as a church. That Father, as we move closer and closer to the end of the end times, that final period of seven, that Lord, our mission, our task, our focus should be on this glorious good news, this gospel. And that we should be investing significantly into world missions, into efforts that help communicate that gospel to people in every people group, language group. Father, those that are here in our country and those that are in theirs. Father, those nations that are open, that that where we can travel and be a part and those that are closed. Lord, I thank you that nothing is impossible and that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church that comes to declare the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to all nations. Father, I pray that you would use us in a mighty way, that you would stir our hearts toward those things. And no matter how disconnected we feel and cut off from what's familiar or comfortable like Daniel was, Father, we don't grow comfortable in a foreign land. We just stay consistent in the word responsive in prayer, sensitive to your spirit and those encounters we expect and look forward to. Father, that we bask in that love that you pour out on us, overwhelming us so that we can be loving and we can be merciful because of what we've received that we also give in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given each of us to take your story in our life and to share our story with others. Without comparison, without intimidation, without fear. Father, I pray that we would be sensitive to your spirit, that we would target people in prayer specifically that we would look for ways to love them into the kingdom, but we would also take the time to share how God has shown us mercy and the love that he had for them and that, Lord, you would change lives just like you did at this altar this morning, just like you desire to do every time we come to you. Thank you for the privilege of living in this generation, God, full of expectancy with the blessed hope, not only of your return, but Father, the transformation that you will bring, the power of seeing a new heaven and a new earth, ruling and reigning with Christ. Connect our hearts with yours and help us stand firm to the end in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Glory to God. Hey, I want some of our prayer team just to be available down here uh, at the end of service. If there's any prayer need in your life uh, this morning that you want to connect at a time, then we want to do that. Um, But we also want to encourage you, um, take time this morning to just thank some of our veterans for their service. Uh, Take time to connect with one another. Wednesday night at 6.30 is uh, youth night in our new Wednesday worship format, but you're all invited to come and be a part of that. We're going to have a great word. Be praying toward that on uh, Wednesday night. And uh, then we're going to have some time to 
connect with some of our missionaries that are coming through. I spent some time last week in Dallas with uh, Ronnie Matheny and Mission Barnabas and uh, some of the Kenyans that are there. Actually, they're here uh, in America. And so some of them are going to be coming through in a couple weeks. And I uh, want you to be a part of that and enjoy that time and that ministry. Share your life with somebody else. Be grateful for God's mercy. Live in God's love. Walk in the Spirit. Be a person of prayer. And let the Word of God be your light and your lamp. Amen? Stand together. Who wants to receive the blessing of the Lord this morning? And now may the Lord bless you. And may He keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you. May He give you peace. May He guide you always in being the kind of person you ought to be. And may you have the privilege of beholding the kind of God who saved you and made you what He is. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord.